Hi, my name is Skip Stewart. I'm the Vice President and Chief Improvement Officer for Baptist Memorial Healthcare. Today, we're gonna to cover a subject and a word that gets used often, but I'm not so sure that we always understand that word. And that word is the word culture. Uh, we're gonna hear from an individual that actually coined the, the word organizational culture and a father-son combination that has over a hundred years of studying, thinking, and writing about this subject. In these videos, we're gonna be looking at the structure of culture, the practice of culture, and then ultimately the dynamics of culture change. So let's learn together. Hi folks, again, it's great to be able to talk to you about this. One of the things that comes up um, for us in every discussion that we have with companies about culture uh, and, and organizations at large about culture is um, this need that people have to make some sort of an assessment so that you can either have a way to measure how your culture is changing or how your culture is improving over time or a way to compare it to um, cultures of, of other organizations. Um, generally assessing culture is uh, you have to you know, be clear, are you doing it to be descriptive? Are you doing it to be comparative? Or are you doing it to be normative? In other words, some culture is better than others and um, therefore you wanna be able to measure it, baseline it and track it over time. Um, there's been a lot of flurry over the last sort of five or 10 years about using um, a kind of a rapid pulse survey approach um, where you uh, es essentially send a five questions to everybody's phone and you can generate a very um, sort of robust uh, response rate. Um, but the question is, um, you know, you, you're only asking five questions. Are you really getting at measuring culture? So, um, uh, in the some of our work, we've described these some of these different approaches. And um, it, again, it's an interesting approach. It gets a lot of involvement. People are asked questions, and they you can usually get a very high response rate. Um, but uh, at some level, it sort of leaves you wondering have you really covered the ground? Um, have you really gotten to what's going on um, to you know what what the people think they're really up to? So Ed, do you want to make any other quick comment about this sort of the the overview on how to assess culture? Yeah, I think it's useful to understand that uh, the old anthropologists who went into uh, tribes where they didn't know anything had no option but to observe and maybe interview an informant or two. But with modern organizations, there's this temptation to use all our survey tools and all our measurement tools because we believe that you, you can't really manage anything that you can't measure. And so I think there's been a huge effort to develop surveys and typologies based originally maybe on some individual interviews and some group interviews. But the problem is in the development of surveys and typologies, you, you gain the precision of measurement, but you have to limit what you can measure to those things that you observe. And what you realize is that when you're dealing with an organizational culture, you have to do sort of group interviews that cut across the diagonal slice of the organization to even figure out what some of the dimensions are that if you later are gonna measure them, uh, how you would design survey instruments to deal with them. My experience historically is that eventually surveys can be extremely useful, but to figure out what to measure and how to measure it 
it really helps neither to do the rapid survey nor to do the big elaborate survey, but to start with individual interviews and then go to diagonal slices to figure out what all the dimensions are that you might have to deal with. So let's let's go through the the let's go through these um, and in the context of this analogy that uh, that we think sort of helps clarify which of these approaches is most helpful. And again, we're not describing any of this in an either or sense. Generally, you know, yes and do all of these things, but recognize that surveys and interviews you know, sort of provide different layers of information. And so uh, the, 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 this first slide is about this idea that if you're doing a rapid survey with sort of five, 10, maybe 20 questions, again, you're generating um, a high response rate on those surveys, but um, you're, you're, you're sort of limiting the kind of information that you can really glean. And so we tend to think of this as if you were imagine you were in an observation vessel on a ship looking back at the land, um, the rapid survey approach kind of gives you a sense of the contours that you're looking at. Um, but it's essentially two dimensional. Um, it may be very useful in comparing um, one sort of set of survey results represented as one landmass that you're looking at from a distance and comparing it to another. They're different. You know they're different. Um, you can see it in the shapes that you've you've you know you've you've gleaned in our in our metaphor here. But it's limited. It's in two dimensions. Um, it's uh, it's 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 what anthropologists have called sort of experience far. Again, you know there's differences, but it's hard to really get a sense of exactly precisely what those differences are from that distance out. The next step is suppose you're in the harbor looking at, at this, uh, this culture. Um, you are able, you're close enough in to generate um, sort of precise observations. And, and by the way, we're, we're making this analogy to now suppose you do a in-depth survey where you're asking 100 questions and your response rate is lower, but you're you're really drilling down on some of the key issues because you're asking a lot more questions. So you're getting a sense for the sort of real structures and behaviors that are that are visible. Um, and uh, it's it's in 3D, right? You're no longer just sil looking at silhouettes. You're looking at sort of the real um, observable behavior. <laughs> Um, so if before we felt like we were looking through a telescope, now the analogy is we're looking through binoculars, we can sort of capture the depth of what's going on. Um, but again, it's not really, uh, we're, we're, we're not really generating a full insight into what's going on until we step off the vessel and get onto the land. Um, so this is the contrast being this is now experience near, it's from within. So not only are you seeing things in three dimensions, but you're see, you're you're starting to generate other senses of what's going on: sights, sounds, smells, um, observed patterns um, in sort of in 3D. You're walking in their shoes, but the important thing to recognize here is that's still at that point in time. Um, you are you're making observations, but it's not over time, and the difference in the sort of the full cultural interpretation approach that we talk about is that once you are experiencing, then you need to get actually in the group. So it isn't just observation, it's actually participant, what anthropologists called participant observation, where they're as, in a sense, as interested in you as you are in them, and it's an exchange of stories and lore, and it's over time. It's important that, that it be sort of recognized that you not only do you need to observe what's going on in three dimensions, but you need to hear how it used to be. It's in, fourth, it's in four dimensions. It's, it's what's happened over time. 
And you don't really get to that level um, of, of insight until you can really sit down, as we like to say, around a campfire and have people sort of start to tell the story. What's, what's, how did we get here? Why did this happen? And back to our definition of culture, it's around that accumulated shared learning. And you really, to really understand what's going on, you have to have people describing to you how they got to where they got, how they accumulated that learning about how to be successful in order to really um, get that deep sense. So again, we're not saying that surveys are, are not useful, they're very useful. But um, our view would be coupled with a sort of deep interpretive approach, um, it's, it's really critical to, uh, um, to sort of couple the two. Um, and so I, I just wanna add one example that, that we've, a lot of times we'll hear about um, a huddle where uh, a team, uh, maybe with the help of an improvement team, um, we'll do a sort of a pre-brief or a post-brief on a set of activities or a set of procedures. And that huddle is a place to kind of share information that may not be on the chart, um, but it gives you that sort of sense of what was really going on. So if you're the participant observer and you get to um, participate and observe a huddle, that's the in, maybe in in some small respects in a healthcare environment the equivalent of being able to start to join the campfire and sit around and see what's going on because you start to get a sense of what are the relationships between these people in this huddle and what are they saying about what has worked and what worked differently this time what are they not saying about um, something that didn't work well um, it's a it's a sort of a microcosm of this concept of sitting around the campfire. Um, the in some respects, the gamble walk idea is very similar to this idea of sitting around the campfire because you um, start to see over time um, what's been working, how is it how how are that adaptations being made, um, how are changes being made in process? Um, and I, we think it's very useful to think about that Gemba walk in this way, not just as um, a sort of a study, but think about as it as an experience. Um, because then you, again, you start to get a sense of how has this changed over time, which is sort of critical in complementing any kind of survey approach that you would take. All of this is by way of getting at what um, Ed and I have been talking about in the last few years as the practice of culture. So we've had that conversation about the structure of culture. And this comes from a famous uh, social anthropology book from Mark Marshall Sons, where he described the structure of the practice and the practice of the structure. And um, those two things, I mean, it sounds like, you know, academic gobbledygook, but the reality is that it's a very good way to think about the difference because the, the, the structure that we've talked about is sort of that, that what, what you can observe and, um, and it's sort of what they are doing and how can you characterize and observe what the, what, or, or observe and characterize what they are doing. Um, the practice is, um, what are we doing? How are we um, expressing what we've learned uh, and how to be successful in our current practice at work? Um, so uh, it, it's kind of the idea of the, the, the structure is the past or our conventions of how we've done stuff. And the practice is how we're doing it now and how we're going to do it in the future or our intentions in our work and intentions meaning what we do now and how we intend to change over time and in order to understand those things we need to look at these three layers which we describe as the technical layer the social layer and the macro layer 
Um, and by the way, within those layers, there's always going to be variances between subcultures and microcultures, but that's a much more involved discussion. And for now, let's just focus on these three layers. The technical culture is really the idea of these are things that are, are part of our strategy, they're part of our mission, and we know that we can change these um, because uh, we've got we discover that we've we've had some accidents, so we need to make adjustments in um, uh, you know how we're, we're sort of planning our workflows, um, or maybe we we the 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 insurance reimbursement changes, so we have to change our strategy around that. Um, that's technical culture, and we're all very become very aware of this. And this is it's dynamic; it's relatively easy to change. Um, but then we we recognize that our social culture, which is kind of how we relate to each other um, and how we um, treat each other at work, uh, you know, may be out of line with changes that we make in our technical culture. This is part of the reason why change is so difficult, is that we can quickly pivot strategically, but if we're still relating to each other and organize in a way to work together that reflects the old strategy, then it takes time for these things to work iteratively. And then all of this happens within the context of our macroculture. Um, and one example of macroculture that, that is a, a change that we have to adapt to is technology. Right, so we we all of a sudden everything's digital. Everybody's got a you know supercomputer in their pocket, and how we can communicate and how we can um, share information and and in medicine, of course, it's 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 incredibly powerful how we can not only share um, words but we can share images and and visuals and and even in 3D. And so we're we're getting to a point where we're in a far different macro culture than we were uh, you know 20 30 40 years ago and part of that too is that the um, younger people in our workforces are much more digitally native as the term is used digital natives that just for whom this this use of this technology is just second nature it's it's natural whereas older employees, um, you know, older healthcare providers may have to be learning um, some of these new systems. So we get into these these differences in the workforces that are all a function of things that are going on in the macro culture. Um, that, this includes, of course, nationalities and includes diversity, equity, inclusion issues. It includes um, uh, any sort of political or, um, you know, global issues that that impact the way we work. So that's the, the, the sort of three layer model for the, the practice of culture. And again, this is continually in that sort of iterative relationship to the structure um, of culture that we described last time. Let Ed, me, do you wanna elaborate? I'd like to summarize that in this way, <clears throat> is when we get interested in culture, we start with the outsider point of view, uh, where we need to, to get some sense of the structure, like in the in the uh, boat approaching uh, the town and seeing more and more detail. But it's only when we're actually talking and sitting around the fire that the question arises of, well, how would we change? any of the things that we're living with. And from that point of view, how we do our daily work in terms of our jobs, our, our technical culture, or in terms of our relationships, our social culture, the outsider now has to be able to see this from the insider point of view. And that's why it's so important at the, at, as change uh, architects, we ha have to really get past taking the boat just to the shoreline and figuring out a way <clears throat> to get, whether it's the Gemba Walk or the, the Culture Change Project, 
to get to that level of the uh, sitting around the fire so that we can, as the helper participant outsider, identify with the insiders and see how they experience the culture, because that's the only way we get a handle on what might have to change. So if we want to evolve or change anything, we have to be able to see it from the insider's point of view, or we will just be wasting our time. That's where these two models have to come together. And a lot of what we're trying to do with these models is provide you with a vocabulary to describe what you're seeing and keep it in these categories so that it doesn't just become this, this sort of vague muddle that we call culture. If we can be specific about what we're observing and what we're experiencing, um, in what terms, technical, social, um, you know, shifts in macro or societal or political, um, then it becomes much easier to sort of break it down and start working these specific problems rather than calling it a culture problem that needs to be solved. It's all about specificity. In the first video, we talked about the structure of culture. And then today we talked about the practice of culture. And in the final video, we will talk about the dynamics of culture change.